Balance leeches are one of my go-to still water patterns, but a few things have changed since the first time I tied one. You know, balance leeches are one of my favorite still water flies. Whether I suspend them under an indicator or use cast and retrieve techniques to get that jigging action of the fly working to my advantage. But since the first videos I put on my channel, I've tweaked and played around and evolved the pattern. Join me at my tying bench. Let me show you what I've done. So let's tie my balance leech bruised, reduxed if you will, to show you how I've evolved the pattern over the years. Into the jaws of the vise, I now use a Daiichi 4647 or a 4640. The 4647 is black nickel and the 4640 is bronze. And the choice is up to you uh, which hook you use. I like number 10, so that's all I ever tie this fly in. And for the thread, we're going to use uh, a firm thread. So you can just use firm thread wraps without the worry of your uh, thread breaking. So we're just going to cover the shank with tying thread and then bring that tying thread back up to right before where that the shank bends down towards the hook eye. Now originally I used to use a common household pin cut to length and that still works today. However I now use sequin pins. I get these at Michael's. I'll put the link in the description below. They come in gold or silver. The beauty of these sequin pins is that they're already cut to length, so that saves a step. And because they have that tapered point, they're less likely to cut your tying thread. Whereas if you cut a common pin to length, you're always going to leave a bit of a ragged edge and there's always a risk that your thread will uh, hit that and break. Now the only drawback to these pins is they don't have necessarily as large a head on them as a um, common pin. I'm going to use some 1 8 inch or 3.2 millimeter tungsten. Always has to be tungsten just like the original but instead of gold now more and more I'm using fluorescent beads, fluorescent orange, chartreuse or even on occasion fluorescent pink. So I've slid the bead onto the pin and I now in, the, in, the, in, early, in my first versions of this fly I used to uh, put the pin with the the uh, bead with the narrow end of the pin facing forward. I now do it with the larger end to envelop and mask that pin head. Just think the fly looks better. And I lash this pin. I load the bead onto the pin, and I lash the pin to the shank using firm wraps. And I used to test balance them, but I've done so many of these flies now that. Pretty confident with this proportion. No matter what size balance fly you're tying, if you can envision, you could get almost two more beads on the pin between here and the rear of this bead, you're going to be at the right proportions. And I also used to do, when I first tied these, is I would put the pin in the vise and actually cover, you know, you basically attach thread to the, to the pin and push this bead tight up against the pin right away and you don't need to do that because the dub body is going to do it for you anyway. So again I just get this lashed in place, bind that down and then as if I was tying a bunch of these I would uh, whip finish the thread at this point, remove it and coat the uh, tie-in area with super glue and let that sit. You always want to add super glue um, because the pin head can, the, the sort of this pin head bead assembly can become uh, dislodged if you go to grab the fly to take it out of the fish's mouth by the pin and bead. The pin and bead does not get involved in the fight of the fish because the fly is still being uh, attached to the your leader using a non-slip loop knot um, and uh, so it's usually mishandling the fly is what causes that bead head to get dislodged so adding the uh, cement in there just adds a bit of reinforcement. For the tail I'm going to use some select marabou plumes now, select plumes I prefer um, because they, the, the, the individual fibers on the plume have a lot of fuzz to them, a lot of um, uh, 
fibers, I guess you could call it. I'm not sure what the exact term is, but it gives you the illusion of bulk without having to add a lot of material. So a mature plume always has a very thick stem, tends to have these nice bushy uh, fibers to it. So if you look at this uh, feather, it's kind of narrow here, and then this portion of the tips is even, and then it tapers up to the tip. So what I'm going to do to prepare this is sort of strip away any of these fibers that are not even. So I'm just going to strip those out of the way. And sort of this middle third of the feather is where you're going to find those nice uh, similar length plumes. And what I do is I just stand them on edge by pulling them perpendicular to the stem. And then I'm going to come into roughly this middle third and strip it out. So maybe an inch, inch and a half worth of, of plumes or fibers rather. So I'm just going to strip. Try to keep this in front on camera. So strip. I can only strip so far and then I roll that back down on what I haven't stripped. So I kind of strip and roll my way all the way down the plume like so to remove my clump. And what that tends to do is when I'm done is I have a nice relatively even tips because I still like to tie in my marabou with the tips intact. I just personally don't like to tear marabou to length. I like to strip it and have the full taper of those tips working for me. I just feel the tail moves and breathes a little better in the water. So we're just going to get that ready to go. I want to tie in a tail that's roughly the same length from the pin to the back of the shank here. Now if I have a few, uh, a few long fibers like this I will allow an element of pinching but uh, not going to tear the whole tail to length. So I get that measured up, transfer that measurement to the base of the hook the bend of the hook rather, come back with my thumb and forefinger to where the thread is hanging and now transfer my grip with my left thumb and forefinger. I'm going to trim all of this away. And then I come in, I lay this on top and then I just put a couple of soft loops around those trimmed butts then add additional thread wraps and then slide my fingers, thumb and forefinger back of my left hand right down to the bend of the hook to secure that tail in. And I tie that tail in directly behind that pin head just to provide a nice smooth base for my um, body. So it's nice and smooth. And then I can come in, if I've got one or two errant fibers, again the fish don't really care. And I still got that one there so we can get rid of that. And again, fish aren't caring so don't worry about it. It's got a nice tail. I can moisten it a little bit. That just helps uh, keep it under control. I still like to add a little flash in the tail. And my flash has always been this uh, uh, 6904 Flashaboo Ice Blue. It has a nice UV fluorescence to it. So I just uh, take the scissors. If you've never seen this before, I come in using the backs of my scissors blades. I will trim a notch in the package like so. Pluck that out and then that allows me to reach in and pull out the, the um, number of strands I need, which is in this case two. So I'm using the package to control the materials for me and just reach in with those scissor points whenever I need. So I don't uh, have mar sorry flashaboo all tangled all over my tying bench or in my tying kit. So I moisten those two strands and I'm going to lay them on top so I've got a, you know, a good two shank lengths of material out in front and I'm just going to secure those right on the side there's two strands there moistened together I'm going to hold the two strands walk the thread down the side of the shank, this near shank, near side of the shank rather, to the bend and get those two strands in then I'm going to come up quickly back up to the original tying point, grab those two strands that are forward of the tying point, fold them over the back side and secure them along the near side. I like to, if I can, to sandwich the tail with flashaboo and then trim it just slightly longer than the tips of the marabou tail. So there's my completed tail. Now the body of this fly is my favorite uh, color in the Arizona Simi Seal. I have a lot of faith in this color. It served me all over North America and down into Argentina. Is black blue. This, this is where the fly's bruised name comes from, the black blue nature of this material. 
So let's uh, show you how I dub this. We'll pull the camera back so you can get a better view of it. So now we're going to form the dubbing loop. So I'm going to take my tying thread, move it forward to about the midpoint. So now we're going to pull down on the thread to expose about four inches of thread. Put my forefinger at that point and fold the thread up around my forefinger to form a loop, bringing that back up to the hook shank. And I start winding back. And at this point, I'm now going to rotate the loop to the top of the shank and then continue winding back. Open turns, but you can see, hopefully, that right at the base of the tail, that dubbing loop is pinched tight. Those two, those two fibers are sandwiched tight together and that's going to help hold my dubbing in place. And I'm just going to advance the tying thread forward, up past the eye, and right up to the rear of the bead, and just push that bead right up there, like so. Then I'm going to take my dubbing tool, and this is a, there's lots of different ones out there. This one's made by uh, Dr. Slick. It's got a weighted end on it, crochet style. I just place that in the loop, and we're just going to let that hang, making sure our two, our bobbin and our um, dubbing uh, loop don't tangle up. And then I'm going to take my um, bruised Arizona semi seal, my black blue, and then I'm just going to pull on this dubbing mix, pull it apart and put it back together again, um, just to free up some of the fibers because it's been sort of squashed in there when it was packaged and stuffed in there. And then pull these apart. And then I'm going to take a little pinch of this dubbing. You don't want to use a lot. You should be able to almost read through it. You can see right through, easily see that orange bead. I'm going to open the loop at the bottom, insert that little pinch, kind of spread it and massage it out, and then slide it up the loop, leaving about an eighth of an inch or so of thread exposed. And just keep doing this, pinching off equal uh, clumps of equal volume, and pushing them into position. You're trying to make a, a dubbing load the loop up here with equal amounts of material so it's the same consistency all the way along so you can spread it out a little bit and keep filling the loop. Again I open it just wide enough at the bottom to push it into place and I've got a little bit of down pressure on the tool. In addition to the weight I'm just pulling on it ever so slightly and that puts that loop under tension so as soon as anything gets in there, it's going to be pinched and held. No need for dubbing wax. I don't like to use the dubbing wax because I worry that it might mat some of the fibers down and kill the translucency, the translucent effect uh, this dubbing loop is intended to create. So I'm just going to start spinning slowly. And again, moisten the uh, tail if you want so it doesn't get accidentally twisted in there. And once it starts to spin up like a drill bit, you can keep spinning like that or you can come in with your forefinger and give this a hard spin like so. When I remove my forefinger that twist is going to carry right up the loop. So we just spin, keep spinning and when that loop, when the fibers radiate out about 90 degrees or that loop, see how it has spring to it, a little elasticity? That means you've got the right amount of twist to it. And now we're almost going to ready to, to wind this forward. So what we're going to do now is take our dubbing brush and just start not too aggressively, but gently, because we don't want to break the loop or pull the vise all over the table. But I'm just going to pick at any areas where the dubbing is clumped up. Arizona Semi Seal is a mixture of nylon, mohair, and the Angelina fibers provide the highlights. And we're just going to pull and pluck that out, basically almost turning this into like a little dubbed hackle. Now we're ready to wind forward. So. When I'm ready to wind forward, I just start. So I've got that bare spot of thread. So now I can wind that right at the base of the tail. A couple of wraps that allows me to walk my dubbing right into the correct position. I'm not stuck in a situation where my first wrap has to be my best wrap. And I'm just going to come up and using my left thumb and forefinger, like I'm sweeping hackle fibers back, I'm just going to sweep this dubbing back all the way. Now the, the dubbing loop provides a very durable body to this fly. It tends not to want to slide back when fish start really chewing on this fly and catching lots of fish. It holds its position. It allows you to create scruffy looking flies that breathe and move so well. So we're just going to keep winding this forward. 
When I get to that hook eye, I go right on by it and right up and, and pack this right in. I think I got just enough to make this. All right, so I keep coming up, keep winding up, keep winding. I just made it. Just made it. So we'll tie that off. Two over the top, two in front, and then we trim away the excess dubbing loop here. So now the fly is basically tied. All we've got to do is whip finish it and then style it. So the first thing we're going to do is take some brushable super glue and we're going to coat the tying thread just below where the dubbing strands are. And we're going to wind this thread, coated thread, right behind the bead. That gets the head cement where it needs to be in that tying off, tie off area. And you also don't run the risk of um, accidentally matting down any of the fibers. Now we're going to bring up our whip finisher and just three to five turn whip finish right behind the bead. Trim away the excess. And now we start the first part of the styling process. So that is to aggressively brush out this fly again to free up any fibers you might have accidentally trapped down. And I brush it against the grain, if you will. I pull those, fi those fibers forwards and then I brush them back and be aggressive. And again, the beauty of that dubbing loop that we've used allows you to do that. Because after all, you're going to ask a fish to bite onto this and chew on it and and pull it all over the place. Whoops, pulled it on the vise there a bit, but just brush it around. So the next thing we can do, if you've got the time, you could certainly take this out, put it in your box and go fishing, but we can take some of the memory out of these fibers um, by dipping the body portion of this fly into a glass of, of hot water. So what I've got here is, um, this is uh, a glass of water that's been put in the microwave for about a minute, so it's pretty hot. And I'm just going to take, bring this up like so, and just dip that, show you there, dip that into the water. Let it cool for a sec. You don't have to dip it too long. We'll place that into the jaws of the vise so you can see. And then you just come in and stroke all that. You can see how those fibers straighten right out. Flow along, give you that natural leech-like profile. If you've got a few long ones, you can trim or pluck them out. And you'll set that aside to dry. So this is your Balanced Leech Bruised version 2.0 or Redux if you want, showing you how I use the different uh, jig hooks now, the sequin pins, how I reposition the bead, the stronger thread, and then just, again, reviewing how I form that dubbing loop and style um, that dubbing. So... A killer pattern, a must-have to me in any Stillwater fly box. I never leave home without a good selection of balanced leeches in this bruised coloration.